Uh, welcome everyone for joining this tiny ML talk. My name is David Sawyer. I'm calling in from Toronto, Ontario today. Where we have a very strong tiny ML community and I'm really excited to have two speakers today. So you picked a good day to join. The topic for today's talk is processing in memory for efficient AI inference at the edge on today, October 13th. Very excited to have you all here today and let's get started. So first of all, thank you to the TinyML strategic partners for committing to take TinyML to the next level together. Also, as many of you may be familiar, we have our growing TinyML communities on Meetup, over 11,000 members in 37 countries. That's incredible. And the LinkedIn community, um, pretty active where lots of chat and, and discussion can happen. The links for both these communities are here and you can use the QR code as well. There's also the YouTube channel. So that's over 450 videos of TinyML, lots of amazing content there you can access already. And for today's talk, um, the video and slides will be available about a couple of days after today. So stay tuned for when today's talk will be available on the YouTube channel. So now let's get to it. I'm very pleased to introduce Kaiyun Yang. Uh, Dr. Kaiyun Yang is currently an assistant professor of ECE at Rice University in the US. He received his BS degree in electronic engineering from Tsinghua University, China in 2012, and his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor in 2017. His research interests include digital and mixed signal circuit and system design for secure and intelligent microsystems, bioelectronics, and hardware security. Dr. Yang is a recipient of the 2022 National Science Foundation Career Award, a 2016 IEEE SSCS Pre-Doctoral Achievement Award, and has multiple best paper awards, which you can see here. Thank you for presenting today. And we have two speakers going to go back to back. Weir Wang will also be speaking. Dr. Weir Wang is currently leading the software hardware co-design and is a founding member at AIZIP, a Silicon Valley startup providing tiny ML solutions. He received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University in 2022, where he worked on designing efficient AI hardware systems to enable intelligence at the edge. His work has been published in top journals and conferences, including Nature, International Solid State Circuits Conference, and Symposium on VLSI Technology and Circuits. He's also the first author of monumental work published in Nature this year, a compute in memory chip based on resistive random access memory, and previously received his master's degree in engineering from Stanford in 2018, and his bachelor's from Berkeley in 2015. So without further ado, gentlemen, please take it away. Thanks, Davis, for the introduction, uh, and thanks, Tanya ML, for hosting uh, our webinar. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for Weir and me to present our recent efforts on building processing in memory, hardware, and systems uh, that enable efficient AI uh, inference at the edge. So pushing AI inference uh, to resource constraint uh, and often battery powered or even battery uh, smart and edge devices uh, will enable great potentials uh, for a lot of applications um, and it opens up a lot of markets. Uh, it brings uh, many benefits in terms of energy, latency, security, and privacy. Um, so I believe this is very uh, familiar to most of the audience here. So we will go straight into our uh, core part. So uh, to enable AI inference at these resource constrained devices, um, we face a very common problem in computing hardware and systems, uh, which is the memory wall. So as you can see um, from this table, uh, the energy you take to do a addition or multiplication is much lower compared to when you read from an on-chip memory or even a DRAM off-chip. So uh, what this means is if your computing requires very frequent data access, and you, keep, you have to keep reading new data and do some simple computing and then put data back into the memory, then your data movement cost will be much larger than the arithmetic operations that you actually do. And because of this, this memory access is becoming the energy and bandwidth bottleneck in your computing. And this is the so-called uh, memory wall. So um, the solution we are looking at uh, to alleviate this uh, memory wall and this bottleneck is trying to do computing directly inside memory so that when you read from the memory, you directly read the computed results instead of reading the raw results and then do the computing off the memory and then put the data uh, back into the memory. So this will help us save the uh, data movement 
uh, cost uh, and uh, improve the throughput and reduce the latency of the computing. So today we are going to focus on uh, the application of in-memory computing in uh, AI and particularly deep learning. Uh, so for this type of uh, computing, uh, the key operation that is the uh, dominant uh, source of energy and latency is the matrix vector multiplication or MVM uh, in short. So uh, we all know that when you uh, run a deep, a deep neural network, uh, you have to repeatedly perform uh, a matrix vector multiplication. Uh, and then for each filter in a CNN, uh, you're actually doing this multiply and accumulate uh, operation. So you multiply the weight uh, with the input activation, and then you sum this over uh, many different uh, channels, input channels, uh, and then you repeat this process again and again. So our goal is try to come up with a better hardware that can do perform this operation uh, more efficiently than conventional uh, digital uh, systems. So here we use a very simple uh, example to show uh, why processing in memory hardware could potentially reduce the energy and latency uh, of deep learning computing. So uh, what I show on the left, it's a simple uh, digital volume architecture that you have a single uh, memory that holds your weight uh, and your activations. So uh, as you want to do the Mac operation, you have to first grab the data from the memory, and then you give that to the ALU that performs your uh, multiplication and addition. And then you get the results into the buffer and uh, potentially you will also write the data back into the memory. So uh, in order to do this, you have to keep accessing the memory because every time you read a memory, you can only read out one row. So here, uh, imagine you have uh, amp columns of weights you want to read. So you have to repeat this process for m times. Uh, and that means you spend m times of the uh, reading energy uh, plus the, so here we break the reading energy into the bit energy that is happening within the memory and then the uh, sense amplifier energy that is happening at this boundary of the memory array. And then in the meantime, it's, you have to repeat this process for m times so that your total delay will be m times uh, the single memory read time. Well, comparatively, uh, if we do processing memory, uh, the goal is we can do the computing and the memory access in one single clock cycle. So instead of serially reading the weights in the memory uh, in IAM cycles, we actually access all the weights in this memory in one single clock. And then we perform the multiply and accumulate uh, computation directly within the rows. So uh, as indicated by this red arrow, uh, this arrow means we are already doing computing along this direction. So we are doing the MAC and then the MAC results will be digitized by analog to digital converter, uh, and then you directly get the MAC results. So by doing this, uh, we do all these MACs in different rows in parallel, so that it only takes one clock cycle, as you can see here, uh, saving a factor of M. And in the meantime, we also save the energy of uh, reading data out of the memory, because now instead of accessing it M times, we are only accessing it one time. So um, on the address part, this is uh, green line part, uh, we still spend IM times, so that's not a saving. But then on the horizontal line, uh, we are only, only reading the analog value once instead of IM times. So here we save a factor of M. Uh, and then we need to use the analog digital converter instead of a simple sense amplifier to quantize the results. So this will be an uh, extra energy, but we don't have the factor of M. So uh, the benefits of email computing is really coming from having a large M, uh, which is the case for deep learning. You have to do this Mac computing in a massive uh, amount and in massive parallelism so that um, we will amortize this ADC energy by a factor of M. Uh, and then in most cases, this will, re this will result in like a 10 times uh, reduction of the energy per operation. Uh, and then in the meantime, uh, 
our processing in memory, we are trying to explore analog computation directly inside the memory. Uh, and it is well known that for low precision computing, uh, analog computing could be more energy efficient than the digital counterparts. Um, and for uh, low precision computing uh, in many of the 10 ml uh, models, so the uh, analog computing could provide enough accuracy. Uh, and then lastly, in memory computing, uh, it requires uh, one cycle instead of M cycles. So it increases your overall bandwidth uh, and reduces the latency for the computation. So this is the ideal scenario. Um, in real designs, there are more challenges to deal with, uh, which will be the uh, core parts of today's talk. Uh, so we will start from our uh, recent efforts on using existing technology, uh, pure CMOS, standard CMOS technologies to make static RAM-based PIM. Uh, this is mostly the work uh, we have been working on at Rice University. Uh, and then uh, after that, we will look at something that's more forward-looking uh, using emerging uh, devices and materials uh, with uh, resistive RAM-based PIM. So we will present a new RAM uh, technology uh, by where uh, which is the result of uh, multi-institution collaboration. Uh, and then having good hardware is not sufficient for building this uh, processing memory computing systems. So uh, where we also introduce some of the efforts uh, that's ongoing at ASZIP to bring software and hardware together and really boost the overall system efficiency. So next, uh, I will start, start, start uh, with the SRAM-based PIP. So uh, SRAM is a very widely used uh, memory device. Uh, it's almost existing in every single digital computing system chip you have. Um, so uh, it's widely available. Um, it has several benefits over other computing memory technologies for processing in memory. Uh, first, so SRAM is doing a digital storage of, uh, of the weights so that it's very stable. Uh, as long as the power uh, is not shut down. And also you can accurately store your weight. Uh, so compared to uh, some results of emerging memories uh, where you have variations of your weight storage, you have uh, fluctuations of the actual weight. Uh, with SRAM, you get rid of all those problems. Uh, you can just enjoy a very uh, reliable storage of your weights. Uh, and second, uh, SRAM is usually the first uh, modules that will be developed for any new uh, CMOS technology. So that uh, if your entire PIM is based on SRAM, uh, you can always enjoy the latest node of uh, CMOS technologies uh, and will, there will be no compatibility or integration issues. So for example, uh, TSMC has demonstrated uh, in SRAM computing uh, within their seven nanometer node. And then the last thing uh, for uh, SRAM is that um, conventionally, uh, it, is, it is well known that SRAM cell is not the smallest. There are many other memory technologies that could provide higher storage density and smaller memory cells. Um, however, for PIM applications, um, using special memories that require higher voltage or special conditions, you really make their peripheral circuits much larger. So comparing these two designs, so this is a RAM-based design. Uh, although the memory array itself is very small, you need a very large uh, chip area as the peripheral to read, write, and compute and control this array. Well, comparatively uh, with SRAM, uh, although the cell is larger, but the uh, peripheral circuits becomes easier uh, and overall, you may not have worse storage density, uh, even compared to the latest uh, uh, very compact uh, memory devices. So for um, SRAM uh, PIM, there are a number of prior arts uh, that are worth mentioning. Uh, so the uh, initial ideas around PIM uh, is all based on current domain computing. So the idea it's uh, you store all the weights in your memory cell. Uh, this could be SRAM or other memories. So here we will use SRAM. Uh, and then depending on the input, you, um, you either turn on this switch or you turn off it. 
And you can also control the duration of your on control signal. So this will encode your input activation. And then depending on the weight stored in the cell, uh, you will provide a different current that is discharging this vertical bit line. And then uh, overall on this bit line, you will actually be performing an operation looking like this. So this is the final voltage uh, as a function of the, the weight, uh, the, the weight, the current, and the duration of your input. So this is exactly the MAC operation we want. Um, so this technology have a this technology have a big advantage of that it is compatible with standard 60 and 80 cells. So um, 60 and 80 means six transistor, eight transistor. These are the industry standard SRAM cells. Uh, we typically want to stay with the standard cells, uh, which have been um, very rigorously verified uh, in mass production, and they also provide the highest storage density. Uh, however, the challenge with current domain PIM is that um, as you do this computing, you will be affected by the linearity of this switch. So there's no perfect switch that can be made in CMOS technology. So all these switches uh, will have a uh, innate nonlinearity, uh, which means as the voltage on this node changes, the current will also be changed. The result of that is you get this red curve as the computing results. X-axis is your ideal computing results. Y-axis is the actual voltage you get on the vertical line. Um, and if you calculate the derivative of this red curve, you can see a slope is actually changing, uh, indicating that it's not perfectly linear. And then we also uh, check if you give random weight and inputs and look at how much error you actually get uh, using this type of computing, uh, here is the result. So you will get on average a standard deviation of 1.85 LSB as your error. Uh, this error, depending on the tolerance of your model, could lead to significant accuracy loss. And also uh, to use this type of uh, current domain PIM, uh, usually you have to limit the number of rows that you can uh, turn on simultaneously. If you turn on too many, there will be uh, more severe uh, linearity and variation issues. Uh, so this will ultimately limit the M uh, we see in the previous slide, and this limit the overall energy efficiency gains you get from uh, processing in memory. So uh, a, a newer approach that tries to deal with the accuracy loss and the nonlinearity issues of current domain computing is called charge domain computing. Uh, so the idea of the charge domain computing is to use charge sharing among capacitors. Uh, capacitors are passive devices that doesn't have uh, nonlinearity issues like the switch we see privately. Uh, and then in most of these uh, charge domain PIM designs, the concept is you first put your input voltage on this capacitor um, that is connected to uh, every single weight storage memory cell. And then depending on the weight you store here, you either convert this input to zero or to VDD, uh, which means uh, multiplying a zero. And then, or if your weight is one, you will just keep the previous uh, voltage on this capacitor. And then after you do this multiplication process, you turn on all these switches. So the top plate of all these capacitors will be shorted and they will perform a, um, a commonly known process called uh, charge sharing. So basically the charge on all these top plates will be redistributed and they will settle down to a single voltage. And that voltage will be uh, described by this equation. So um, effectively, you will get in a final summation voltage that is the summation of the weight times the input voltage. So again, this is the MAC operation that we want to achieve uh, with the uh, process in memory hardware. So with this one, uh, as mentioned, because of the good linearity of capacitors, um, the simulated linearity is much better. So the same plot, 
uh, the ideal output code versus the actual voltage you get. And then the derivative can be seen uh, to be much more constant uh, across the entire range. And the capacitor variation uh, still exists, but it is much smaller than the variation you get with active transistors. Uh, so the limitation of this type of uh, charge domain operation is, as you can see here, there are multiple switches uh, associated with this operation, and you don't get to require multiple steps to do the operation. And this will lead to relatively large memory cells uh, and also uh, uh, slower operations because it requires multiple steps. And then uh, more recently, uh, with an effort to reduce the computing circuitry uh, added to memory cells, uh, a different types of uh, charge domain computing has been proposed. Uh, so this new type of design is called bottom plate driving. So the idea is instead of doing the pre-charging of the capacitor and then discharge based on the weight and then do the charge sharing, uh, here all those steps are combined into a single step that you drive the bottom plate of the capacitor with your input value that is multiplied with the weight, and then you directly do charge sharing on the top plate. So this uh, uh, enjoys the same linearity and accuracy as the normal uh, top plate chart domain computing, uh, but you can potentially reduce the complexity of the switching circuits here so that you can have a smaller cell area and better parallelism. Um, but a, a key problem with this type of design is that you have to have a very strong driver to drive the bottom plate uh, to accurately provide the input signal. Uh, and then as studied in this work, uh, this input buffer itself is taking up around 63% of the total energy, uh, which is a dominant source and not very desirable. Um, so um, trying to get rid of this extra buffer uh, will be a key design challenge to make better charge domain PIM hardware. So here we provide some more detailed analysis on the energy and area of input drivers. Um, so in addition to the bottom plate driving in the charge domain computing, it is very common to see other types of analog drivers uh, in PIM designs uh, for driving the input signal, like in this work, um, and also for the analog to digital converters. Uh, because normal analog to digital converter designs, they require input driver to sample the input signal on a capacitor. Uh, and then it also requires drivers for the reference voltages. Uh, all these drivers, um, require high power consumption. Uh, and because the large number of uh, DACs, the input drivers, and the large number of ADCs we have uh, for a PIM uh, system, uh, the total energy associated with these drivers will be the dominant source of energy. Um, and that will greatly diminish the benefits we want to get uh, from PIM. So in summary, uh, here, I write down a vision list uh, in designing good SRAM PIM uh, circuits uh, that will reach the desired 10x energy efficiency gains. Uh, so first of all, we want a high parallelism, which means you want to turn on more rows at a time, because this is the key factor that will amortize your ADC energy, amortize your computing energy, and also will give you a higher throughput. Uh, second, we want a high storage density, yeah, especially for edge uh, computing, we probably want to store the entire model uh, within the on-chip memory uh, so that um, the storage density should be high. And that means we want to use the most compact memory cells, um, meaning the six transistor or maybe eight transistor uh, standard cells that's widely used in the industry instead of using very customized complex circuits for the computing and storage. Uh, and also this means we want smaller uh, circuits for the analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. And thirdly, we want a high computing accuracy. Um, this means we want to surprise the nonlinearity of transistors as they do 
analog computation. And we also need to deal with variations coming from process, voltage, and temperatures, uh, and also random noise being added to any analog operations. Uh, in addition to this uh, circuit physical level uh, noise and variation source, uh, we also need to consider inf the information loss due to extra A to D converters. Um, this can be dealt with through software and hardware co-design that we will brief briefly mention at the end of today's talk. Um, and lastly, um, the, the goal for doing processing memory is to have better efficiency, right? So we have to uh, achieve a good efficiency without compromising all the other parallelism, density, and computing accuracy. Um, and we figure out that the key to improve the efficiency is to get rid of all the analog drivers uh, that are shown in the previous slides. And also we need very uh, compact and energy efficient analog to digital converters that are specifically designed for processing in memory. Uh, it is worth noting that a lot of these different uh, targets, they have trade-offs or, uh, uh, or conflicts with each other. So it is the goal for these designs to uh, try to mitigate these conflicts uh, so that we can get high parallelism without compromising the accuracy, and then we can enjoy higher efficiency. So uh, here, uh, I will show our first attempt to do this. Um, so we present a uh, charge domain computing called CAPRAM. Uh, this was the first design that utilized industry standard six, tra six transistor SRAM cell. Uh, for doing char domain computing uh, with very high accuracy, uh, and it supports uh, a multi-bit input and multi-bit weight. So it can natively perform four-bit input activations, and it will use digital serial processing to support up to eight bits of weight. Uh, so the key circuit here uh, is this extra uh, computing circuit uh, composed of three extra switches and one capacitor. So they are attached to a cluster of uh, SRAM cells. Uh, every time one SRAM cell that's storing the weight will be selected for doing the actual uh, MAC computation, while the other cells in the same cluster can be used for waste storage of, uh, other, uh, of other layers that are not being activated at this time. Um, and the key uh, design challenge here is we want to provide a high impedance uh, node at this local bit line so that when we do the computing, we will not destroy the weight being stored in the SRAM. Uh, so keeping all your weight stored in the memory safe, uh, it's, a, it's a key priority in designing this circuit. Uh, so the detailed operation of this is shown in the paper. So if you're interested, you can go and check that out. So for the um, analog to digital conversion, uh, a key Thing. It's uh, conventional ADC designs. Uh, we will need to sample the input onto a, a capacitive deck uh, that is a large capacitor that you, you sample the input voltage, and then you gradually uh, change the deck configuration to approach the actual uh, voltage input voltage level uh, so that you can quantize it. Uh, but doing that will require a very large analog driver, as we mentioned. And also you need a large capacitor array that cannot fit into the very tight space uh, in P micros. So as a result of that, uh, we leverage a recent uh, uh, new ADC concept. Uh, it's called charge injection ADC. So the idea is you build this uh, transistor-based charge injection cell that will remove charge from a existing capacitor. And here we take advantage of the fact that since we are doing charge domain computing, our computing results is already existent on a large capacitor so that we no longer need to move it to a different capacitor. We just remove charge from this uh, capacitor embedded in the array uh, so that we can perform this analog to digital uh, conversion steps. Uh, so this results in a very small uh, ADC design uh, that can perform seven bit quantization uh, and it doesn't require any sampling operations. So uh, this is the prototype we built uh, for CAPRAM in 65 nanometer CMOS. Um, so um, it achieves a very high uh, accuracy and high storage density because we use six transistor SRAM cells. 
Uh, so on average, including the extra computing circuits we added, uh, the SRAM cell area is increased by around 30%. And it uh, uh, allows configurable precisions of the input and the weight. So here it's some of the simulation and measurement results. So in simulation, uh, compared to the uh, current domain computing, which you have this nonlinearity, this is our measurement results. Uh, and this shows almost perfect linearity for the uh, computing result. And then translating that to a uh, computing error with random input and weights, uh, we have a standard deviation of 0.9 LSP versus 1.8 LSP, uh, as you will see in a current domain computing. Uh, so this is showing the performance of the analog to digital converters and the entire end-to-end -end computing flow. Um, so here it's showing the right lines, showing the mean value of the ADC across the entire chip. Uh, and then the blue lines is showing the variations, the three sigma variations uh, of the ADCs. Uh, and here it's showing the nonlinearity. Uh, ideally, you want this to be all zero. As you can see, our nonlinearity is staying within uh, plus minus 2.4. 2.5 LSB. Um, and then across different chips, uh, it achieves uh, a very similar and consistent performance. Um, and then here it's showing the noise performance of the, of the uh, entire computing flow. You can see the errors coming from noise is always below 0.5 LSB. So that is the cap prime. Uh, so in cap prime, uh, we have been able to have a very high story density and high uh, uh, computing efficiency. Uh, however, we, we have to do the cluster-based system, uh, so which means you only turn on uh, a part, a subset of all the SRAM rows. Uh, that is sufficient for a majority of applications. However, if you want to uh, target the best possible efficiency and throughput, uh, it will still be better to have a fully parallel design, which means you turn on all memory rows in one clock cycle. Um, so to do that, uh, we have to solve the same challenges. Uh, and also we need to make even smaller analytical converters that fit into every single row. Uh, so to do that, uh, we introduced DCT RAM, uh, which is a driver-free, fully parallel capacitive PIM. Uh, so with this design, we have a uh, driver-free charge computing scheme uh, that solves all the problems uh, associated with the input drivers, output drivers, uh, and also the computing accuracy problems. And then we also have a new time domain analog converter that uh, largely use digital uh, logic gates that can actually fit into uh, a single column of SRAM. So, um, so the first idea to make this happen is the driver-free charge domain computing scheme. Uh, so the key thing here is we want to get rid of the input driver that we see in previous work because they take around 60% of the energy. Uh, to get rid of that, we have to sample the input on this capacitor. But the reason the previous work, they cannot do the sampling is because they don't provide a constant impedance at this node so that uh, you have to use an analog voltage driver to drive this node instead of a uh, current-based uh, input driver. Current input driver can be much simpler and much more energy efficient. So uh, what we do here is we uh, come up with this new design of the computing uh, mechanism. So in this mechanism, when you do the input sampling, we can make sure the impedance at the sampling node is constant so that you can use a simple current deck, uh, which is essentially a single transistor uh, to sample your input voltage onto this capacitor. And this is the key idea that make it possible to do driver-free capacitive computing. So with this new circuit, we do need two extra transistors to make it an eight transistor cell. So that's not as ideal as the six transistor, uh, but with this one, we are able to get a uh, 1.5 micrometer square per cell. This is around 50% larger than a standard six transistors SRAM cell. So here is the detailed operation of the uh, charge domain computing. Uh, I will quickly go through it. Uh, if you want to learn more detail, please check out the paper. 
So basically what we do in the first step, uh, we have this structure that no matter your weight is stored in a zero or a one, uh, you are able to see the same impedance uh, uh, to this bottom plate of the capacitor so that you can use a simple current source to charge these nodes. And then uh, depending on the, so this is the charging process. And then depending on the value of your SRAM cell, which stores the weight, you will either uh, charge this uh, intermediate node to VDD or you keep it to the previous value. This is essentially doing the multiplication with a zero or a one. And then after that, we will do the charge sharing, uh, which performs the final MAC operation. And the second uh, key idea uh, for this DC theorem uh, is we have a time domain uh, analog digital converter. So the idea here is uh, instead of trying to directly quantize the voltage, which require you to have capacitive or voltage references or like the charge injection cell we had before, uh, what we do here is we convert the voltage to a time signal, like a pulse. And then we can use a time to digital converter that is highly digital to quant uh, digitize this, this pulse. And then for a uh, time to digital converter, because uh, it is a digital structure and it's used a timing reference that can be easily shared among all the columns, we can actually have a very tiny local circuit for every column and then they can all share a single timing reference. Uh, but the, the problem with a, a straightforward design using flash DDC is you have an exponentially increased area for the local part, which is not ideal. So that uh, we want to do a folding type time to digital converter. So uh, instead of having a very long uh, chain of uh, delay lines, you can fold this delay line and have a counter uh, when it wraps around. And then uh, this ring oscillator can be power hungry and you don't want to have a ring oscillator for every single ADC. So you can actually share it by all the um, TDCs in your entire array. So this will amortize the energy and the area uh, for the oscillator. So this is the overall design for the uh, time to digital converter uh, that with the shared ring oscillator. Uh, you can see the entire design of the ADC is only occupying five micrometer by 65 micrometer. This makes it possible to fit this into a single column of SRAM cells. So we can achieve fully parallel computing without uh, greatly change the peripheral to core memory ratio. So as you can see from this die photo, uh, the ADC is only taking this much. So it's a very reasonable ratio of area that you spend on the peripheral. And this will greatly help your overall storage and computing density. So again, accuracy is of most importance. Uh, and this one achieves uh, similar accuracy as what we see in the CAPRAM uh, with a 0.69 uh, LSB error. And then uh, this ADC time domain ADC also enables us to do a gain of two, uh, which means we can uh, increase the resolution to two times of the original uh, and focusing on half of the range. Uh, this could be very useful for uh, deep, most deep learning applications as your activation never occupy the entire range. And here are the uh, system accuracy tests. So we ran CIFAR 10 uh, uh, using ResNet and, and modified VGG and also CIFAR 100. Um, and comparing at uh, activating different rows, we can get a very good uh, accuracy. Uh, and here it shows our results. Uh, the MAC results comparing the ideal simulation results. So this is in your software, what you expect versus what we actually see on the chip. So you can see they're almost in uh, perfect agreement. So uh, this is a comparison with state of art. Um, we have a, uh, we can achieve a pretty high uh, energy efficiency, 200 teraops per watt uh, for a four bit operation. And that's equals to over 1000 uh, terabit ops per watt. Uh, so, Professor, one couple of quick questions, actually, while everyone can look at this uh, this table. The first question from Jan Lewis, would you please compare your 60 CAPRAM, 8T, and existing E-Flash approaches in the sense of technology maturity, power, I, I assume power consumption, and real industrial applications? That's the question. 
Okay, um, so uh, the area of the six transistor cell, um, as we mentioned, it's around 30% larger than a standard 60, uh, in, like industry standard 60 SRAM cell. So depending on the technology node you are looking at, uh, it could be comparable with the e flash. Uh, if, you are, if you are looking at a very advanced node for the SRAM and an older node for the flash, but at the same node, apparently the flash will be smaller. Uh, but as I mentioned, the peripheral circuits for accessing a flash memory is much larger uh, than a SRAM. So overall, if you compare the entire uh, erase area, um, I don't have the number, but I think like, the flash will not be much smaller. Uh, but then in addition to that, the SRAM-based method, it has much better computing accuracy because we can do the char domain computing. Well, for flash, as far as I know, uh, most of the work they are doing current-based computing. So you will, they will suffer from some of the same problems I mentioned for the current-based in SRAM computing. Right. Thank you. Okay. So um, yeah, then where we'll take over to the RM based. Cool. Uh, thank you, Kai Yuan. So, um, so here I will briefly introduce our recent work on RM-based PIM. Uh, but first, because RM is a relatively newer memory technology, so let's look at what RM is, right? So RM stands for resistive switching random access memory, and it's an emerging non-volatile memory that can be directly integrated with CMOS, right? So RM stores information with its resistance, and uh, the resistance can be toggled between a high value, a low value, and often you know, many intermediate values by applying an electric field across the device. So RM is not exactly a, a new memory technology that only exists in research lab today. So in fact, the what we call the single level cell RM, which stands for those RM cells that can store a single bit per cell. So they're already commercially available in multiple CMOS foundries as a replacement of embedded flash for sub 40 nanometer process. And the multi-level cell is currently still under uh, development. So compared to SRAM, which is apparently a much more mature memory technology, so RM offers several benefits, right? So first, at the same technology node, RM can be potentially uh, much denser. Right? So here I show uh, the comparison of cell size in TSMC's 40 nanometer and 22 nanometer uh, CMOS technology. So in both of these technology nodes, RM already exists as embedded RM macro. Right? And in these two technology nodes, uh, the RM cell size is about 3x smaller than the high density SRAM cell size. And with further device optimization, uh, the size can be even further shrink. And meanwhile, the RM is uh, analog programmable, uh, which means that each cell can store multiple bits. So together, these two properties would allow RM array to potentially store a bigger AI model within the same area footprint. And also due to its, its uh, non-volatility, uh, non -volatility, uh, the information can be retained without a static power consumption. And this is very desirable for those low duty cycle workloads uh, that is either always draining static power or alternatively requires you know, frequent power down and wake up. And such low duty cycle workload is actually pretty common in tiny ML scenarios. So to use RM to implement PIM, uh, we can uh, simply treat each RM cell as a programmable resistor, right? So the operation is quite straightforward. So first we can map the weights onto the conductance of RM array, and then we can send input vectors in the forms of voltage pulses towards one end of the array and measure current from the other end. And this is essentially the multiply and accumulate performed through the Kirchhoff's law, right? Here, I only show the most straightforward case where uh, the multiply and accumulate Simulate output is a current, but uh, uh, similar to what Kai Yuan has said about the SRAM, uh, the computation does not have to happen in the current domain. It can also be performed in the voltage domain or the charge domain. And in fact, we found this is 
one of the key determining factor for the macro level uh, energy efficiency. Again, similar to SRAM. And also the efficiency number many times uh, depends highly on uh, the DEX and ADC design. So compared to SRAM-based PIM, uh, RM-based PIM overall is at its earlier days. Uh, but over the past few years, as the process of meter grading RM with CMOS becomes increasingly mature, so there has been a growing number of RM PIM test chips. So however, these chips focus primarily on uh, circuit techniques to improve the efficiency, but few work has tried to improve other important aspects for a complete PIM system, such as uh, the versatility to support different neural networks and the inference accuracy. And these different factors are all critical for the broader adoption of the technology. And meanwhile, the AI benchmarks uh, reported from these previous RM-based PIM works were often partially simulated rather than fully measured from the hardware. And usually there can be a quite large discrepancy from the simulation and measurement results. And this is because the analog computation can be affected by many different types of circuits. And now with RM, the device, not idealities. So in the software simulation, although there are many attempts to model these non-idealities, but it's still very difficult to model all these non-idealities accurately. And finally, for the few studies that did report the measured AI benchmarks, uh, those benchmarks were either uh, very simple tasks, such as uh, uh, MNIST classification or limited to one single application, like uh, image classification. So here is our attempt to address these limitations. So this work was part of my PhD thesis research at Stanford in collaboration with UCSD, Tsinghua University, and University of Notre Dame. So we published the work in uh, Nature uh, this August. So in this paper, we presented a 48-core RM-based uh, PIM chip named a new RAM. Uh, so uh, here are some really nice photos of the chip and uh, from the photos, you can clearly see uh, the 48 core design, right? And the full chip is about the size of your fingertip, and it contains a total of 3 million RM devices. And here is a cross-sectional TM image uh, showing the monolithic integration of the RM and the CMOS. So the chip was uh, fabricated using a two-step process, right? So first, the RM and the uh, bottom four layers of metals were fabricated using a commercial foundry 130 nanometer process. And then the RM, uh, as well as the top layer metal, were then integrated using a research lab process. But I want to uh, point out that here we use a two step process mainly because you know this is a university research project. But as I said earlier, uh, there are you know CMOS integrated embedded RM already available at Commercial Foundry today. So with the new RAM chip, uh, we really try to simultaneously improve all these three important aspects of a PIM chip, the efficiency, the reconfigurability, and the accuracy. And importantly, as uh, what Kai Yuan also mentioned previously, these three aspects of design are not independent of each other. And many times the improvement of one aspect comes at the cost of the other two, right? So here I want to give two simple examples. So we can gain efficiency by you know, having a very large array size such that the ADC and DAX cost can be amortized by more RM cells, right? But many times this also sacrifices the flexibility if you want to map you know, smaller weight matrices or, or irregular weight matrices onto the PIM array. Uh, and you can also gain more efficiency by using a lower precision ADC. But again, this would sacrifice the inference accuracy. So really, this trade-offs between uh, you know, the efficiency, reconfigurability, and accuracy is a fundamental trade-off that cannot be addressed by isolated improvement on any single layer of the design. So our approach to ameliorate such fundamental trade-off is a full-stack co-optimization 
from device and circuit all the way to architecture, system, and algorithms, right? So this approach has led the neuron chip to not only achieve the highest energy efficiency among all the existing uh, RM uh, PIM chips, but can also support diverse model architectures and achieve an inference accuracy comparable to digital hardware. So more specifically, uh, on the device level, we fabricated multi-level cell RM devices with high analog programmability and high yield. And on the circuit level, uh, we designed a voltage mode neuron circuit that can perform MAC operation in the voltage domain. And on the architecture level, we designed this new transposable neural synaptic array architecture that allows the PIM array to change data flow direction and realize matrix transpose with minimal overhead. On a system level, we integrated 48 cores that can perform operations in parallel. And finally, on the algorithm levels, we use hardware-aware neural network training and fine-tuning to overcome various circuit and device level non-idealities. So here, I will not go into the details of each technique, but if you're interested, I would encourage you to check out our paper or uh, talk with me offline. But here, I would just like to briefly highlight several mean results measured from NeurAM. So first, in terms of the energy efficiency, we measure its energy delay product, or EDP, for performing the neural network inference. So the neural chip can consistently achieve the lowest EDP across various computational bit precision among all the existing RM PIM chips, although the, this neural chip is actually fabricated using an older technology node. And here we show you know, the classification error measure on the neural chip for a variety of tasks, including image classification using CNNs, voice command recognition using RNNs, and image recovery using RBM, right? So the red bars in the middle are uh, the results measured from the neural chip, and the blue bar and the gray bar on the two sides corresponds to the software models quantized to four-bit weight and three-bit weights. And all the input and activations of the neural networks are also quantized to four bit or lower. And we see that the neural chip could achieve an inference accuracy comparable to software models with four bit weight for all the measured benchmarks. And importantly, all these re results shown here are completely obtained from hardware measurements rather than through stimulation. So, okay, so, so here, um, here are the main takeaways for the talk so far, right? So we introduce both the SRAM-based PIM and RAM-based PIM. So for the SRAM-based PIM, they can provide high energy efficiency and high compute density, and they use a mature and scalable purely CMOS process, and they're ready for production today. So for RAM-based PIM, it can potentially provide higher compute density and lower static power. And the single level cell embedded RAM is already commercially available but the multi-level cell RM devices, which is more suitable for the PIM applications, are still under development. So we see RM PIM as a promising technology for the future TinyML devices. So, so far we've been talking about the test chips. So next let's look at the software hardware co-design. So we all know that going from these test chips to actual PIM products, hardware design alone is not sufficient. So we'll also need many other things, including you know, data collection and curation, robust model training strategies, efficient model architecture, and good SOC level architecture design. And to really push the frontier of both efficiency and robustness, we really need to closely co-design all these different layers together. So this code design including two parts, right? So from, from bottom up, we need to optimize the model architectures and training strategy based on a hardware. And from top down, we should define the SOC architecture based on the data and the model. So here at AIZIP, in addition to providing tiny ML software solution and services, which is currently our main business, we also provide a full stack PIM code design services for IC companies. So first, we have 
a PIM silicon IP licensed from uh, Rice University, as Kaiyuan has previously introduced. So the IP has been verified on silicon and is ready to be commercialized immediately. Next, we have a full SOC level architecture design, right? The accelerated design is not just about uh, matrix vector multiplication. It also needs to handle many other operations and needs, and needs to handle these intermediate data movements. So our SOC architecture design will guarantee end-to-end -end neural network support and optimize for the full system level efficiency. And we also have a deep neural network optimized specifically for PIM structure, which we call the PIM net. Right, so PIMnet can achieve high utilization on large PIM array while still being efficient in parameters and memories. So the application spans vision, audio, and time series. And finally, we have developed a PIM-aware training framework. So it allows us to tr train deep neural network models to be resilient to various hardware and non-idealities. So with this full stack PIM solution, AIZIP can support our IC partners during the entire IC product development and distribution cycle. So we could sub-license the Silicon IP, provide IC design consulting services, and we can handle tiny ML model design and development and support joint market promotion. And for each customer, depending on the specific need, we can tailor our services to work on a subset of these stages. And for more information on these uh, uh, co-design services, uh, we, we will present uh, you know, more details in the upcoming TinyML Asia Forum. So with this, I will conclude today's talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. That was an excellent presentation. It's, this is very exciting work for the future of, uh, of not just TinyML, but AI in general and hardware. So let's go through some questions we have here. Um, please, either of you, whoever feels more appropriate to answer, please please take the question. And we'll try to keep things brief. We will go a little bit over time here, everyone. So don't worry, we're not going to stop in two minutes. We'll go a little bit past time, depending on the questions. So the first question, I think this was referring to your inference accuracy. It says, what's causing the lower than 95% accuracy? And what applications can your proposed approach reach 99% accuracy? Right. Uh, so I guess I can try to answer this. So. Uh... For these common benchmarks that, that people has a, a, a very good ideas about what is a good accuracy, such as Cypher 10 or Google Speech Command. So the reason uh, that the, the current neuron chip measure is a, a lower than uh, the state-of-the-art accuracy is that we very aggressively quantize all the weights and inputs to low bit precisions. And that includes not only the intermediate layers, but also the input and output layers, which has been uh, uh, found to be the most sensitive to low bit quantization, so, right? So for example, for the image, we actually quantize them also to three bits. Uh, and, but of course, by applying more advanced quantization techniques, we can uh, uh, improve that. Got it, thank you. Yeah, that's, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, the next question, I think this was relating to software hardware co-design. It's about how is the experience of collaborating with software developers? How have you tackled the challenge of exposing these new chips and architectures to software teams? Right, so so uh, so here at AI Zip, uh, we actually have a uh, 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 talent covering the entire uh, design hierarchies from data model, embedded uh, uh, embedded system design, as well as hardware architecture and circuit design. So these different people actually collaborate very closely with each other, and this way we can very closely uh, co-design all these different stages together. Excellent, excellent. Uh, two more questions. One is um, about the RM. RM is temperature sensitive. How do you compensate for that? Right. So this is a very good question. So in this neuron chip, we actually didn't uh, uh, we didn't uh, consider this temperature uh, and P in general PVT uh, variation very carefully. But in order for it to enter production in the future, uh, definitely uh, we need to. Uh, uh, you know, accommodate that uh, through co-optimization, both on the circuit level, architecture level, and on the uh, model training level. Excellent. Okay. And our last question here, it's a bit more open-ended. So the question is, is from Ramath. It says, uh, I'm still a beginner to making RM. Can you give me uh, tips and tricks? So for beginners, any, you know, ideas about how to learn to make chips um, in, in topics with RM? 
yeah so uh well rm by itself is not a uh, just in terms of the device stack, it doesn't look too complicated. But in fact, the device physics, even today, is still not, uh, you know, there's no good understanding. So definitely different combinations of materials, different device structures. So, you know, just read papers and, uh, uh, you know, try to replicate what people already have and uh, optimize based on that. Cool. That's good advice. Well, with that, um, thank you, Where, Thank you, Kaim, for a very interesting question, uh, presentation. Actually, I think we have time for one more question. This just came in, and then we'll, we'll do one more question here. So the question is, how do you compute layers other than matrix multiplication, such as activation functions and pooling? Right. right. So this uh, so this is what uh, I refer to in the full SOC level architecture design. So we actually adopt a hybrid digital and analog design, uh, and these some other operations that are more, suit more suitable for digital processors will be, you know, deployed onto the digital part. Perfect. Okay, so now um, we'll take things back over here for the outro. Uh, thank you again to both our speakers. That was a very, very informative talk. Um, as everyone can see from the presentation, you have gotten some uh, a poll. If you can please provide feedback on today's talk. It's very quick, five questions. That'd be very helpful. And if you have questions that you didn't get to ask today, you can take it online in the tiny email forums. The link is here. Now, uh, a big thank you to the tiny strategic partners that make this possible. A lot of amazing companies that power this, this ecosystem and allow speakers like this to be here. To our executive strategic partners, we have RMAI powering tiny ML innovation, Edge Impulse, the leading development platform for Edge ML, Qualcomm AI Research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous, a Sentient, making Edge AI a reality. For the Platinum strategic partners, Dplate, fastest video analytics solutions on ARM CPUs. Click Attack Global IoT Solutions, Reality AI, tiny little software that covers the full engineering lifecycle. Renaissance is enabling the next generation of AI powered solutions that will revolutionize every industry sector. Sony Semiconductor Solutions Corporation, and the Gold Strategy Partners, ALR Devices, where what if becomes what is. Photo Hub, making over the air firmware and ML models updates simple and accessible. Microsoft, NXP, Accelerating the breakthroughs that advance our world. Seed Studio, deploy TinyML into the real world, plug and play ML. Sensi ML Analytics Toolkit Suite for AutoML. ST Microelectronics, providing extensive solutions that make TinyML machine learning easy. Synaptics, engineering exceptional experiences. Synsense, building Sensi and inference hardware for ultra low power. And to the Silver Strategic Partners, AI Zip, Aeon Devices, EMSA. Greenwaves, Gravity Inc., IBM, Imagimob, Itemis, Nota AI, OctoML, Prophecy, Kixo, Rixen, SAP, Silicon Labs, Stream Analyze, and TDK in Vincense. So uh, this concludes today's talk. Again, a big thank you to our speakers and thank you for everyone attending. Have a wonderful day, night, evening. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.